to learn lasted about five more minutes. Uh, today's topic, as you know, is housing in San Francisco and the Bay Area. We have uh, with us Laura Clark, who's the founder of SF Gimby. Uh, that stands for San Francisco Guest in My Backyard. We're a pro housing organization. So just in two, five more minutes. If that's not what you came for, you got to eat somewhere else. Sorry. Attention! If, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, um, hey, uh, hey, hey, quiz. Um, we're gonna do a learning lunch here about uh, SFMB and, and housing in San Francisco. You're all welcome to have a conversation during lunch, just not right here, because we're gonna try to keep it quiet so we can um, 
hear what we're uh, and learn about all about housing in the Bay Area. Again, we have Laura Clark, the founder of uh, the Yimby Action SF. Yimby uh, Yimby stands for Yes in My Backyard. Uh, it is to counteract the um, I think perhaps uh, unfortunately inevitable movement of anyone who becomes a homeowner to then uh, become a NIMBY, which is no, not in my backyard. Uh, and that's gonna be an interesting topic. So she's gonna present for us for, um, for a little while. She's gonna go through some slides. We're gonna learn about the housing situation, learn about her organization a little bit. I'm gonna um, have some questions to interview her a little. And if you guys have questions, uh, please get involved. So maybe uh, let's do it. No further, with, further ado, Laura. Hey, um, so I'm gonna start with a couple quick questions. How many people pay rent in San Francisco? How many people are really upset about it? Yes. <laughs> uh, so we're here to help. Um, so this is like uh, who we are a little bit. Um, we've got more than uh, about 300 members across the Bay Area advocating for more housing. Um, fundamentally, we believe in cities. Um, we believe that we can build dense, vibrant cities of opportunity where people should be able to move to uh, and find really great stuff in them. Um, but they have to be continuously built. This isn't a one-time build it, set it, and forget it. Um, people are moving to cities. People, we're, we're still having babies. Um, we need transit-oriented cities that continue to grow in order to be that inclusionary place. Um, what has happened previously and what sort of the current state is, is that it's really freaking expensive. Um, so this is a little bit complicated, but we consider an affordable city when you're spending less than 30%, 30% of your income on rent. Um, back in the 60s, um, all renters, 23% of them were, were pretty much at affordability. Now, 52% uh, of people are spending more than 30% of their income on rent. Is that San Francisco data or is that nationwide? And this is San Francisco data, sorry. Um, and then uh, poor renters are even worse off. Um, I'm going to skip this one because it's really complicated. Um, the, the problem is political. Um, it's not that like we have a small geographic area. Uh, Manhattan is an island. They managed to build housing there. Um, it's not you know, a lot of other things people say. Millennials complain too much and you need to pull yourselves up by your bootstraps. Um, it's not some kind of weird corruption issue. Um, it's that we have laws that keep us from building the housing that we need. Um, how did we get that? Do people know what redlining is? Maybe. Okay, so uh, back when you were allowed to just totally be racist, uh, we had this thing called redlining, where governments and uh, homeowners associations uh, created uh, what were desirable areas where you could get loans and where they would sell to minority people. Uh, I mean, sorry, opposite of that. Uh, bad areas where they would only sell to minority people, and then the good areas where they would sell to only white people and only wealthy white people. Um, and as you can see in this graph, it kind of reflects what our current zoning map is. So as we went from saying, oh, we're not allowed to to just be on full-on racist uh, we have to create rules that basically continue that systemic racism throughout the system so that we have single-family home only zoning which is a third of the city you can go up to uh, four stories maybe but you can only have one family live in that house those laws were deliberately put in place because people didn't want dense urban and they didn't want a minority people and they didn't want apartments and they didn't want the city to come into their neighborhood. Um, zone capacity. So this is LA where we have a little bit better data. Um, we used to, the legally allowable amount of housing used to be a lot higher. Even though we hadn't built it yet, that was how much we could build. And over the decades, we brought that down further and further and further and further so that less and less amount of housing was legally allowed to be built. And, and since about the 90s, we've started hitting up against that barrier where people are still moving to cities, but we are not legally allowed to build much more and certainly not at the rate that we need to build it. Um, some of this happened because we were blasting through our cities with highways, and that was really bad. Um, there was this idea that it was cool to be out in the suburbs, people needed to get in and get out. We did a lot of really destructive things to our cities, um, and so people rebelled against that, you know, these, with these cute hats, save us from the freeway. Um, and they said that 
a lot of the bad things that were happening were, were big government or big corporations coming in and destroying their city. And so we created a system of hyper-localism. Um, additionally, we had problems where public housing was really neglected. Um, we had this big concept of blight. Um, so the urban core was scary and full of crime. And so they did things like in the Fillmore district, uh, they just destroyed a whole bunch of public housing, uh, told people that they would be able to return, but never did. We did a lot of really destructive things to low-income people and everybody in our cities. Um, and so the response to that was uh, hyperlocalism. Um, this shows sort of how out of joint our uh, production of housing to uh, our population growth. Um, so the production going down and the population, you know, dipping a little bit, but staying pretty much the same, this is how out of balance we are. Uh, it takes a really long time to get your permits. Um, so uh, this is, can everybody see this kind of stuff? I feel like it's a little hard. Um, so we do the lowest number of permits. Um, so the idea is there are two big problems. One is what's the allowable zoning, and two is how long it takes you to actually get your permits. We take a really long time. This is the permitting process. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm not gonna explain this slide because nobody understands, because it's freaking nuts. Um, this is how insane it is to get your permits to build housing in the Bay Area. Um, the big problem is that we have 101 different municipalities, each making little hyper-local decisions. Um, Brisbane, has anybody heard of Brisbane? Uh, okay, cool. So it's, it's actually our nearest suburb and it touches San Francisco. Um, and they're making a decision right now about a big housing and jobs uh, house complex that they're gonna build that's gonna double the size of their town, except that they touch San Francisco and you should sort of think of them as part of the city. Um, but instead, they're going through a really difficult emotional journey about whether they want to allow more people to come into their <coughs> community. Um, and they're probably going to only build more office space and not build more housing because they think of themselves as a small city. They don't think of themselves as part of the Bay Area. Um, the established power of former revolutionaries. Um, so we have a lot of people who, uh, you know, this is the Coalition for San Francisco Neighborhoods. Uh, there are people who live um, a lot in the west side and south side, homeowners um, who fight to protect their community. Um, they believe that that means not allowing more housing in their neighborhood. Um, and so they use all of these uh, mechanisms to keep developers who are the bad guys from building housing near them. Um, 101 municipalities. Um, this idea of community means that uh, in order to let your voice be heard in a lot of these things, it means you have to show up to a lot of meetings. Um, how many people really want to show up to a community meeting on a Thursday afternoon? Come on, guys. <laughs> community. <laughs> um, so that's when the decisions get made. Um, this was an effort to make sure that the community was heard, and what it has meant is that retired people are more likely to get their voices heard. Um, established power, people who have a lot of time on their hands and can go to 14 meetings. Working people really struggle to engage with this process in any meaningful way. Um, yeah. This looks boring because it is. This is what I do. <laughs> uh, so I go to these hearings and uh, talk about uh, sort of the overall good and why we need to build a lot more housing. Um, the problem is a chicken and egg problem. So there hasn't been an identifiable pro-housing voting block in San Francisco, in the Bay Area, uh, really in the U.S. before. Um, the the Previous identifiable voting blocks were fighting for tenants' rights, which are really important, um, but weren't fighting to just increase the overall housing supply. And so uh, all of our politicians weren't really speaking to that. And so the people who might be activated by that were coming forward because the politicians seemed sort of mealy-mouthed and not speaking to them. Um, and so there wasn't anything happening. Um, you know, pro-housing people were not saying anything. Um, but obviously, people are moving with their feet to cities. Um, people like cities. How many people like walking to a grocery store? Yeah. Um, how many people hope they never have to own a car? Yeah. Um, this is a real new growing constituent. And the only way that we're going to really activate that is becoming a voting bloc. Um, we have to change the laws. Politicians change laws. 
politicians get to the heads of parades. As soon as you have a bunch of people, you're going to magically find some leadership. Um, so we need to build a parade. Um, and this is what that looks like, um, canvassing for candidates, endorsing candidates. Um, I think a lot of people are struggling right now to figure out, you know, we're all freaking out about Trump. When someone says get involved, what does that mean? What is the physical action of getting involved? Um, and the physical action of getting involved is doing things like showing up at community meetings, uh, is canvassing, is uh, engaging, sending emails to your local uh, politicians, um, joining membership orgs who you believe in so that then you know that they are fighting for your uh, beliefs. Um, this is a sort of display of our membership. Um, this is something that we try to bring to politicians to make it clear that they know that we are speaking for a large constituency. Um, what are our sort of core beliefs? Um, that there should be opportunity for all. This is how we continue to grow the parade, is by getting that message out there. Um, luckily, President Obama is a total yimby, and he came out with some really great white papers that I could send to you, but I bet you don't want me to do that. Um, jobs and access, this is the fundamental feature of what yimby is about and why the movement is growing. Um, families and community. This is a big message, that we can build inclusive communities where people are coming and joining us. Um, and also small businesses. Um, a lot of small businesses are still in the mindset that their uh, constituents, that their customers need parking. They haven't quite gotten on to the people walk into my store uh, bandwagon. And so getting that message out there uh, that we can have dense, vibrant cities is really important. Um, and weirdness. Um, cities are the only place where you can find micro niche communities um, where this is why LGBTQ people move to cities, um, is because in dense urban environments, you can find weirdos like you. Um, there is no Star Trek club uh, in the uh, rural main town that my family is based in, um, but luckily I found one here. Um, this is what cities are really about and why young people want to move here. Um, this is what a parade looks like. Um, so this is just some quick facts about what we do. Um, we had volunteers canvassing during the campaign. Um, and that's hitting the streets, knocking door to door, or making phone calls. Um, we raised some money, distributing campaign literature. Um, we have a podcast that's really fun that we bring uh, different uh, politicians on to come talk about these issues. Um, you know, and then there's like weird, obscure things like the ADEM election, which is who gets to go to the convention that most people don't know he's even a thing. Do people know that we elect Democrats to go to the California Democratic Convention? No. Yes. Uh, um, but most people don't even know that that's an election. Um, and so to get people involved to pay attention to these small local issues is the only way that we're going to really solve this. Um, so the four policies, things that we need to change fundamentally, um, there's two really important ones and then two important ones that there's more movement being made on. Um, so the zoning, what's allowed on paper? Um, it is a, a catastrophe that a third of the city is zoned for single family homes. Um, that, that is something that cannot be allowed to continue. Um, but changing zoning is really hard and makes people really mad. Uh, and so in order to do that activism, we need to be really strong. Um, the entitlement process, uh, minimum three years, uh, often 15, um, it's totally messed up. Um, and there's not, because it's difficult and annoying, uh, and there's a lot of different interest groups that use the entitlement process to extract things. Um, so there's a lot of people who will say, I, you know, a neighborhood group that demands a, another hearing, a discretionary review hearing, um, will then get a payoff from the developer. Uh, in the form of donations to their favorite local nonprofit or doing a community garden or all this stuff, all of that stuff ends up really slowing down the, entitle enti the entitlement process. Um, it means that it's not follow the rules, get your permits. Um, and then there's funding for a subsidized. Um, so we do need more money to go <laughs> to our subsidized affordable housing. Um, the uh, 
I don't know how many people know about recent cuts that are going to be made to HUD by the Bush administration. That's going to be really bad. Um, we're looking for other funding sources for our subsidized affordable housing. Um, so that includes um, getting rid of the mortgage interest tax deduction on million dollar homes so that that money, we're gonna be taxing multi-million dollar homeowners a little bit more and moving that money into subsidized affordable housing. Um, that's a proposal uh, at the uh, federal level. Um, but there's also things at the state level, such as uh, a similar mortgage interest tax deduction to go to subsidized affordable at the state level. Um, AB 71, if anybody wants to contact uh, somebody. Um, so we do need more money for subsidized affordable. The other thing is bad incentives. Um, so California has this thing called Prop 13 that locks in people's property taxes at the rate that they purchase their home at. Um, so that has done a lot of things to make people like screwy. Um, so that means that a wealthy homeowner or somebody who bought their home 25 years ago, they are paying taxes based on the assessment at the time of purchase. And so no matter how much money their house now becomes worth, they're still paying an extremely low tax rate. Um, so there's no incentive for them to see rising home values as a negative. They see rising home values as only a positive because they don't have to deal with rising taxes. Um, so those are kind of the big things that we work on, um, and I hope that you guys will become a member. Um, I know you're going to have lots of questions because I breezed through a lot of stuff, um, but the basic idea is that we need to form a parade in order to activate for this stuff, um, and so you can go to yindiaction.org slash join, um, where you can uh, join subcommittees that are doing a lot of the everyday activities that are going to move this forward. And go to gimby.store to get a shirt like that one. Yes, t-shirts are important. Um, that, okay, that was, that was really good. So I'm going to ask some questions, and then you guys think of some good ones, too. But um, Yeah, we'll have a seat. Um, one of the questions, I come back to my, my case, which I bought a house last year, and, um, uh -oh. and it has a view um, of, of the city. I can see the Salesforce Tower going up. And I really don't want someone to build in my backyard. So, I, and, and yet, I'm like a big advocate of building in everyone else's backyard. So how do we get homeowners to sort of do something that might be in their own, against their own self-interest? Or is it that we need less homeowners and more renters? So I actually would put a third category okay. in there. Um, because I don't think you can get people to not be selfish. Um, Unfortunately, well, yeah, so I would love that. Show them that in fact they're um, they're wrong about what their self interest. So I don't think you can. Um, I think that actually you have to say that the laws have to not listen to them so much. Um, mm. That that so Japan is a good example that freaks everybody out. Um, they make their land use decisions on an almost national level, and so we make our land use decisions on an almost block by block level. And so you're selecting for, uh, you know, the local homeowners have the ability to come out and stop something. Thing, rather than all of us making a decision about what the rules are going to be and then you would say like oh I freaking hate that but I don't actually have the right to go and stop that because 10 years ago I agreed that the rules were going to be the rules so what is needed I guess then if we're talking about a law and a change of statutes like what actually needs to happen to prevent um, the neighborhood association from being able to hold an appeals you know what has to change um, so actually there's a great uh, so buy right is what is the sort of golden calf, I guess, um, which is your story. Yeah, no, B Y, <laughs> um, <laughs> B Y right. Um, so this is um, a system where it basically says if you follow the rules, you get your permits, um, and so it it gets you through a lot of the gauntlets that we have put on housing. It says you can't do. I mean, I can name all of these different things: discretionary review hearings, uh, eighteen months environmental impact reports. Uh, this terrible uh, misapplied law called CEQA, which is the California Environmental Quality Act, which was originally designed to protect the environment, but uh, about 70 or 80 percent of the CEQA lawsuits actually shut down housing in infill housing, which is the more environmental one, building in existing cities. Um, so all of this lumps under uh, things that people use to stop housing. So and is, it, is it a whole series of laws that need to be changed? And, and therefore, like, it really is a movement? But I mean, it, 
what does it therefore take? Like, how many people are we away from that tipping point where we can get the folks needed to do this? Is it, is it enough? Like, because I come back to this point, like homeowners are always going to vote against you, so you need more renters. We do need more renters. Um, I think that there are enough homeowners who have millennials living in their basements that uh, we can get those ones. Um, <laughs> and uh, we have enough homeowners who like have kids in general and sort of recognize that this is a problem. Um, I think we also can tap into boomers who would like to downsize, but because there's no apartment in their neighborhood, if they wanted to move into a smaller you know, apartment or something, they would have to move, you know, they, they might be convinced that they should advocate for apartments. But fundamentally, um, it's a statewide problem. Um, and the larger you make the pool of the decision makers, the likelier you are to have the general good, the smaller you make the percent, you know, the number of decision makers, the more likely you're selecting for just the most like hardcore people. Uh, the metaphor is like the caucuses versus uh, voting in a primary. A caucus is a really difficult thing where you show up all day and and you have to be a little crazy to want to do that. Whereas a primary we just go in and vote is more likely to be more democratic. We need a system where you don't have to show the intensity of your opinion. Um, you can just vote once uh, and the general good is more likely to be followed. Interesting. I, I, um, and, and so like, but as we um, build, there is a fair amount of construction going on south of here. Yeah. And is there a moment, I mean, we have so many people wanting to move to San Francisco. I and mean, the biggest tragedy of the housing crisis in San Francisco is that it's a national economic inequality problem of like people in country, in areas of the country that don't have the jobs and opportunity cannot move here and they're, they therefore cannot vote here yeah by 110 percent um you know so like we do what we are doing is kind of the hardest kind of political activism um we're activating people who are younger less likely to vote uh who are uh more likely to be moving that makes you less likely to vote um and also representing people who haven't moved here yet uh so who obviously can't vote um so yes we're totally freaking crazy um but it still has to be done um, and so I, I do believe that we're at this tipping point where the crisis is bad enough that people are engaged and they, they need this problem to be solved. I also want to sort of say there is a lot of housing being built in specific neighborhoods. But if you look at this is the zoning map, right? All of this is like frozen in amber right about here. The yellow is single family. The yellow is single family and like duplexes. Um, and then, and I think triplexes too. But um, all of this lighter yellow stuff is all single family homes. Um, and we just down zoned an area. Um, so this community, that, mean? that means that it went from being single family homes to being single family detached homes, which they thought then meant that people couldn't build, build granny flats in their garages. Um, so this, uh, Local homeowners group, Midtown Terrace, if everyone wants to go now, Midtown Terrace, the bad people. Uh, they, uh, they lobbied the government and said, uh, our, we should not allow people to build more housing in our neighborhood. Uh, and they got their zoning changed. Um, so that's the worst thing that can happen. Um, we need to be activating people, especially out on the west side, to say we need to upzone, we need to increase the allowable housing that can go in across here. Are these laws like actually coming before a vote every few years, or is it we're not even there where the, the, the right law is not even being proposed to get them? So the Yes and no. Um, so there's something called the Affordable Housing Density Bonus Program. I know, catchy name. Um, but it's been rebranded as Home SF, um, which is more Googleable. Um, and that is um, to build more housing on transit corridors. Um, and that is the first upzoning that the West Side has seen uh, in decades. Um, it's a good first step. Um, but actually entirely changing the zoning map um, is something that uh, you know, as sort of the third rail. Is it political suicide basically today? Yeah, but you know, that just means we need more people in our parade. Yeah. Um, the, uh, and, and how far are we, I mean, I just, I'm just curious, like how far Don't are we? Don't them. Because, well, no, because what I think you can do is, like at some point, couldn't some company like Google, that has, well, Google makes $26 billion per year in profit, profit. Uh, for those in, at Flexport, uh, 
that's more revenue than Kunanago makes, and that's profit. Like this is, and um, what if they were to come and buy houses? Because a renter is going to vote with us, and a homeowner is not. I keep coming back to that point. So if if a massive company or hedge fund landlords come in and buy all the housing and then put people let people live there who would vote on our side like i'm trying to think like how many that is the most how much would it cost? Ever no I, i'll give you a better <laughs> one what if we what if we bring um container ships and just build housing right on the right on the port like no, so that's so uh pre <laughs> stuff like that uh is is something that san francisco is fighting hard for so i didn't get too much into all the incentive groups but um, prefab stuff w is definitely a thing that people are pushing for. Okay. Um, the people who are fighting against that are unfortunately often also pro-housing allies, labor unions. The labor unions don't like that uh, the Can job- Can you go around them all together by no. just putting like, it in a ship on the sea, like right at the port? Like there's no zoning on the water. <laughs> And yeah, there is. Yeah, the Coast Guard would definitely come and confiscate you. But uh, it would be great. If you want to organize that, I would definitely videotape it. And <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just assuming that, yeah, of course you need permissions, but it might get around some of the traditional, like, tradition blocker. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the problem is, like, we, we do need to change the laws. Like, I, I want it, I would love... But then, we would the do, people who lived in a container ship be residents of San Francisco and allowed to vote? Because we just need to get it to a tipping point where we have enough renters and enough gimbies. That's, like, that's... Sorry, to like... Right. We are there. Yeah. Right? We're at the tipping point. Like, fundamentally, I believe, and, and you know, maybe I'm a little crazy, but I believe that... The influx of people to cities is enough to demonstrate that people want to live in cities. Like there is, the voting block is there. What are the rules of how many people can I register to vote who live in my house? Like should I get lots of people? I will not endorse fraud. Fuck <laughs> uh, fraud. I got a lot of people yeah. in my house. Um, all right, we can open this up for questions. Molly in the back over here. Oh, the allowable zoning? Yes. This one. So we started with no zoning laws, right? There wasn't a, like, the, the, this just wasn't a thing for hundreds and hundreds of years. We just didn't do that. No, we got scared of cities. Um, we got to decided that cities were places where people committed crimes and, um, well, you know, the 60s where like the solution to pollution is diffusion, right? Where it was like, just if you just spread the people out, less bad things will happen. And that's also why we blasted through our cities with highways. Um, they just decided that density was a, was a net bad. And so they, and, and you know, and as uh, hyperlocalism became more of a factor, more communities said, well, we want to keep things the way they are, so we're going to bring down the zoning and so that more housing won't be allowed to be built here. Um, but it was piecemeal over time. Um, and, No, dense, they thought density was bad. Like, I mean, like, this was a, like, urban theory in the 70s was that density was bad and that density caused crime, that, like, people were, like, in cages like animals and if you put them too close together, they'd, like, freak out and murder each other. Like, really, people thought that density was bad. Um, and then... I don't think we need to make them think density is good. I think people already think density is good. I think the fact that you didn't even know that there was a group of people back in time who thought density was bad is a perfect example of like, we're already there. We just need people to vote based on that. Because you have that belief. Like you're, you're like, I want to walk to my grocery store. I like my apartments. I want to bike. Um, you know, you're there. Um, I think that there's two things. Like one is like I, changing hearts and minds is really hard. Um, it is really, really hard. Um, I think, you know, we can talk a lot about, you know, this is why I do sort of a, like, oh, oops, wrong way. 
um, like density is cool, right? Like we do some kind of, um, you know, this stuff, the proselytizing stuff. Um, we do some education on like the reason why the rents are so out of control is because uh, the, that we haven't built housing for 30 years. Um, there's some of that, but I do think that fundamentally, um, most people already think we should build housing. I mean, we, there was a big poll that came out recently um, that was uh, pretty pointed in the way that it asked the question. And it was the first time we were over 50% on, do you think we should build more housing in your neighborhood? Um, and we crossed up. And in San Francisco, the, the polling data was really a little bit too, uh, not, not statistically accurate enough, but there was 70% said, yes, more housing in my neighborhood. Nobody has voted that way before. So it's really a question of getting them to the polls and getting them to, to know how to express that opinion that they already have. Well, I like the general movement the end goal, uh, but it's quite lofty. So I, I'm worried about the, as, as Brian was saying, the sort of political suicide that you're running into and that just pushing the movement out of, out of existence entirely. So what are some of the small, you know, the small low hanging fruit Wins that you can get now. I'm kind of thinking, especially in LA, a lot of surface parking lots that are always empty. Can those be expedited and up zoned? Totally. Um, so there's a lot of small, so we, on the day-to-day -day basis, we work on those small goals. So um, an easy one is accessory dwelling units. So those are converting garages and existing houses into granny flats and that kind of stuff. Um, there was a state law passed that made them easier, but in order to get them actually built in local municipalities, um, we have to pass laws on a local level. Um, so, you know, that's like, I didn't go much into that because like it's really boring, but I like it. I mean, you can like, you know, like we have to create a handbook by the planning department so that the people will actually be able to follow the rules so that they'll get ministerial approval. You know, all of that kind of small stuff is definitely a day-to-day -day struggle and like fighting. So today there's gonna be extre an extremely intense hearing uh, at the Board of Supervisors if anybody's an SF Gov TV addict. It's going to be really good this afternoon um, where you can watch people fight about a housing development in the mission. And there's going to be a lot of crying. So I would say this would be a hearing to definitely watch. Um, so, you know, that, that you're, you're exactly correct. Um, we do take small steps in order to get to the lofty goal. But can you talk about the, uh, the upswing in development of new housing that we've seen all over San Francisco and how that trends? So it's good. It's been very short-lived. People are already wanting to roll it back. Um, and it's also taking place in very specific neighborhoods. Um, it's not all over San Francisco. The west side, the south side, uh, still frozen in amber. Um, there's a, a small subsidized affordable housing project trying to be built by some adorable nuns in a cute little neighborhood called Forest Hills. And the neighbors have rebelled with a fiery passion. Um, so like, though, I mean, you can't get more heartwarming than nuns trying to build subsidized affordable housing. Um, but, uh, you know, it's going to take them at least another two years to get their permits, you know, so like, Though there is housing being built in what was uh, previously thought of as undesirable neighborhoods, all of the previously thought of as the nice neighborhoods have uh, shirked their responsibilities, frankly. I have a question. How much of this is San Francisco specific versus the Bay Area more generally? I mean, do we have the same problems in Oakland? I know it's not like that cheap in Oakland. So. I would say they interact with each other. So the, the 101 municipalities mean that the pressure on San Francisco is even higher. Um, the fact that Palo Alto doesn't build housing uh, really affects San Francisco. Each, because of Prop 13, which I talked briefly about, where they don't get more, the, the city doesn't get any more money in their coffers, really, for building Is that housing. statewide, Prop 13? Prop 13 statewide. Um, so each municipality has really bad incentives to continue to build job hubs in their community and not build housing. Um, and that exacerbates the crisis by a lot. I have a couple questions. Sorry. The first is, uh, does you or does you support uh, the total repeal of Prop 13? Because some of the other issues created by Prop 13 make it 
increasingly hard for young people to stay in cities like New York. Like I know the San Francisco Unified School District is a disaster in part exactly. because of Prop 13 yeah. um, and some of the other uh, state tax related zoning issues that kind of cascade. So is that like like the golden goal? Totally. I, I would, total repeal of Prop 13 uh, is definitely something we talk about a lot. Um, there do need to be some uh, things done for low-income people who would lose their homes if we immediately repealed Prop 13. So there does need to be something done for uh, you know people who may be living in a million dollar plus home but have a very low income. If their taxes immediately jumped up, they would be... Uh, pretty screwed. So we would build in some buffer for them, um, and you could do that pretty easily. Um, but yes, we do advocate for the entire repeal of Prop 13. And also, everyone should know, like, Prop 13 is the devil. It also applies to corporations. So Disneyland pays almost nothing in property taxes. Like, yeah, get really mad about it. Um, Sorry, yeah. kind of adjacent question. So a lot of people benefit in San Francisco benefit from living in units that were built before control um, like that's just not a political reality in San Francisco right now and I'm not I wouldn't fight to get rid of rent control I, I just think that that's like not it would it would it would hurt way too many people um, yes there are some negative consequences of rent control but um, the, the existing positives outweigh that um, the only way so what happens with rent control is that the longer you're in an apartment the larger the differential because the rents keep going up, the larger the differential between the rate that you're paying and what the market would bear for that same unit, the larger and larger that gets. And so your landlord has lots of incentives to be awful and do whatever they can to get you out. And additionally, your ability to then find an equivalent place down the block is probably zero. Um, so I think the best way that we can help people in rent controlled units is to build a lot more units to bring that differential down so that there's less of an incentive to, uh, for landlords to figure out sketchy ways to be awful to get tenants out. Um, and additionally, so that you can move and not have it be, it, we like to say that um, displacement doesn't happen when you get evicted. Displacement happens when you can't find an equivalent place down the block, and suddenly you're out of the community. Suddenly, your you know your commute is an hour long. You're cut off from every social service, your entire friends network, and your life is completely fucked. Um, evictions shouldn't be a life crisis if there's enough housing so that you can find sort of a you know if, if a pipe breaks, you should be able to find another place. It, it seems to me that housing. Is it's the one problem that actually costs nothing to fix. Like all of our problems in this society are gonna need tons of money from the government to come and invest and make things happen. And in housing, all you have to do is be like, okay, you're allowed to build. And the market will provide all the capital and solve the problem if you allow construction. But I do think we are always going to need subsidized affordable housing. We're always going to, I mean, maybe, you know, but, but maybe we could do some when the property was built is pretty silly. I mean, I yes. had rent control for three years here, and you guys know I don't deserve subsidies from the government. That's silly. Well, I would, rent control is not subsidized affordable housing. So rent control. It is, sure. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's the government taking money from the landlord and giving it to me. Sure. That, that's a definitely a way to look at it. I'm sa When I say subsidized affordable, I mean government-funded housing public housing, but mostly that housing is run by private nonprofits who get money from the government and from other sources to build housing that is means tested. I, I just know way too many people that have rent control who are um, just, like for example, I even have a, friends of mine uh, who own an apartment in Oakland that they rent. And then they rent, they live in an apartment here that's under rent control. Well, what do they, so they, they live here, they pay like 600 bucks a month. Their apartment in Oakland, what do they do? They only will rent it to uh, law students or doctors, uh, MBA, uh, business, sorry, what do you call it? Medical students, school students, because they know that they're going to move after two years for the job opportunity. 
It's like, oh my God, how do you live with yourself? It's, yeah. it's evil. Yeah. <laughs> They're not good friends of mine, friends of a friend. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, like there's always going to be assholes. Like, you know, there are, but then too many of our laws don't account for the second right. order effect. Yes, yes. But the biggest way that you could solve that would be to have a lot more housing so that the incentives are not so perverse. I, I totally agree. Maybe one or two more. In law unit, yeah. Also known as an ADU. Are there places where stuff like that is happening with the white zoning law where people are trying to make the best of the situation? Like, how do I help the state to react? So, illegal in law units, uh, ADUs, um, are a big part of the gray market of housing. Um, and that's definitely a thing. There was an effort to make those legal. Um, and to, but the problem is most of them were not built up to code. And so bringing them up to code is a complicated issue. Um, but what would be great if we could do is drop backyard cottages into people's backyards. Uh, unfortunately, that's illegal. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we're going to be fighting for in the next few months is fighting for backyard cottages. Um, and especially, uh, it's a great place to do those prefab. Container houses. Uh, container houses. You can drop them in people's backyards. Um, so in the sunset is a great place to do that. Um, our laws currently don't allow for it. Um, and so you could, you know, there are rogue it backyard cottages. Like people do do it in San Francisco. Um, you know, and then their neighbors call and, and it's a whole mess. Um, so, yes. Okay, we'll do one last one. Um, uh, uh, no, I, I hear a lot about this one, sure. And you haven't touched on transportation, which is mentioned in this a couple of times. This last crop, they funded up or they voted for upgrades to Muni and BART and bike lanes, but then nobody paid for the crop to fund it, the bond initiative. So, like, one half and the other failed. And, like, I used to live in London, and the public transport here is absolutely atrocious. The buses suck. <laughs> like, and there's like a thing, like white people don't like buses, and the spot, we have the year of the bus in London when I live there, and the buses are great. There's no reason for like, people not to like buses, other than the fact that the buses are funded. But they're very, very slow. Uh, well, oh, they don't have to be. Trains. I have a thing against the trains. Uh, yeah, so uh, similar with the schools, uh, the biggest reason why our transit sucks is Prop 13. Um, that we just don't have a lot of money that we should have uh, for funding these things. Um, and so additionally, we did pass the BART bond, um, which is going to have, it was a regional thing that's going to have some impact. Um, it's not going to be as big as we all think it could be, but it's not bad. Um, but there, you know, YIMBY advocates for transit as well, um, but there are other organizations that focus on that. Um, transit Riders Union, uh, uh, Bike Coalition is great. Walk SF is great. We um, are sort of in the like early days of forming this kind of urbanist coalition um, with other uh, pro-transit activists. Um, transit suffers from a lot of the same problems um, that housing does with the fragmented decision making. Um, 28 different public transportation systems in the Bay Area. Um, so like why is it that like the Palo Alto bus system that you don't even, I don't even know what it's called, but there's like a little Palo Alto bus system that doesn't talk to any other bus system. Um, you know, it's fragmented and old and broken because we've chronically underfunded it. Um, and so I would agree with you. Um, is there any municipality, so the, back to London, the mayor of London has one power, which is to manage the public transportation. Uh, is there any move to like the mayor of the Bay Area to do that? To create, to create a mayor of the Bay Area. So, I mean, like, I'll tell you, yeah, my biggest... <laughs> I nominate Phoebe. Uh, 
So I got told that I was like, had two big ambitions. I'm gonna, my secret 25 year plan uh, is to incorporate the entire Bay Area into a single municipality. Um, you know, New York, the five boroughs operate as one. Um, it's pathetic that we don't. Um, so there's some ways that we're moving that with uh, this, the ABAG MTC merger. Uh, yeah, don't worry about it, it's not really gonna help. Um, but there are efforts to start to do that kind of stuff. Um, it really does require, so like SB1, Senate Bill 1, that we just passed is a big omnibus transportation bill um, that's going to have some impact. Um, but really the, you know, the, the golden calf, yeah, is Prop 13. We need to deal with it in order to deal with a lot of these other problems. So right now we're talking about uh, what's called the split roll, which means we would do it for corporations and then hopefully we would do it for homeowners too. Um, I worry that if we do it for corporations separately from homeowners, um, all that's going to do is further incentivize local municipalities to double down on only building job hubs and not building housing. That's the sort of unforeseen uh, outcome of that um, because they would they would extra not get any money from building housing and they would extra get more money from allowing uh, businesses to come in and buy land. Um, so, but that's the current move is the split roll. Um, I think it's called Evolve with love backwards, I think, is uh, a Prop 13 reform group. Um, we talk about it all the time. It's because of all the different municipalities all over California, it is the third rail right now, um, but we're ready to touch it. <laughs> awesome, all right, well thank you, Laura. Let's give a round of applause there. Um, Everybody, um, please, she's got some cards here with more information about her organization, but you can go, tell, tell them the name of the website again where they can go. Yimbyaction.org slash join, um, and uh, freeze at the bottom. And um, we'll make sure that we, uh, next time there's an election, we'll, we're going to make sure that Yimby uh, sort of roster of issues and candidates gets in front of our team so we can vote in the right way. And I also want to say, you know, Obama says, so everybody listens, uh, that uh, democracy doesn't just happen on election day, it happens every day. Um, and so this is one of these problems that we need people to be active on on a daily basis. Um, you know, pick up the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, you know, Has anybody um, written a bot that just sends faxes to the politicians all day? Uh, so we have a new thing we're working on, actually. If you go to comment.yimbyaction.org, um, that we will be blasting out. If you become a member, you'll get this push, but it makes it much easier to send emails to your supervisor. Um, so yes, and we're gonna have a hackathon if anybody wants to come. Oh, yeah. All right, let us know about that. Okay, thanks a lot. It's fun, right? Yeah. yeah. I. I mean, my... No, no, no.